Amen. Let that be our prayer this morning that all the peoples would praise the name of Jesus, including and foremost us. And um, as we continue to sing, um, we sang this song a few weeks ago with the children's choir about Waymaker and just talking about how um, the Lord is our Waymaker and He is the Promise Keeper. And so let's continue to worship His name.
I know you're disappointed because the pastor's not here, <laughs> but we need to pray for him out of town and with the family, and we pray enjoying himself. Now, before I get started, I want to tell you something I found out. I'm not certain about our pastor. I went back there to where the personal restroom is, and the toilet paper is on the bottom rolled out instead of on the top. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> oh, me. <laughs> Yes, you may be seated. All righty. We need to open in prayer. I, I certainly need your prayer today. I've got a little bit of something everybody has, I guess, with the sinus or allergies or whatever's going around. But I am privileged to be here this morning. And uh, so pray for me to be able to stand up here for two services. I don't feel real strong. But I have a Savior who is stronger uh, and he can put it all together as he chooses, and so we're going to just rely upon him this morning. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the joy we have to come, uh, Lord, here before the church family and to proclaim the word of God, Lord, and the teaching, I believe, Lord, certainly true in the last days, in the last days. We may be there, Lord, right now, and uh, we're not uh, date setters or any of those kind of things, but we trust completely Again, Lord, that uh, the hour and the day that you've decided on. No man shall know the hour of the day. The Bible teaches, even Jesus said that, but he gave us some signs of it. So help us, Lord, this day. Bless, meet every need now, and meet with us as only you can. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Oh, you already did that. <laughs> But no, I know in our, in our class this morning, Brother Charles Darcy took charge of it. I was there for most of it. Uh, but he started talking about today, you know, June the 6th. And he talks about 77 years ago in 1944, D-Day. They had a D-Day and an H hour. Does anybody know what D stands for on D-Day? Stands for day. You know what H stands for? Stands for hour. There's no, I thought there was more behind it than all that, but anyway, uh, there is, that was a day, uh, and all the invasion and everything that took place, and thousands and thousands of young, young men and women, for that matter, went out into eternity. But again, we have freedom and liberty in our country today based on events like that, and I believe there's going to be another day real soon uh, when the Lord's coming for us in the last days. You know, uh, I say this often, many of you maybe have heard me say this before, but uh, my wife is not here. She'll be in the next service with four of our great-grandchildren living with us, and, our, and their mother is with us today too, Miss Tricia. So we'll be praying for them in a second hour. But, uh, but my wife and I, we are in the last days, one way or the other. I'm 77, she's 75, we're in the last days, and the argument in our family is who's going first? She said, you can't leave me, and I said, you can't. We, we wrestle with that back and forth. And Maybe the Lord, I would love to be in the generation of the rapture of the church. You all know what I'm talking about? The catching away. I've been caught up in the air to meet the Lord in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That time we call the rapture of the church, and you and I as part of the church. If you're here this morning, and you're a child of God, you're a Christian, then you are part of the bride of Christ. And one moment it's going to happen that God the Father in heaven is going to say to his son Jesus, go get your bride. And it's going to happen just like that. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet shall sound. And that, that's what takes place. I'm looking forward to that myself. And kind of along with this thing where I mentioned about uh, one way or the other, about the comings and goings, well, my wife's last name, maiden name, is C-U-M-M-I-N-S. And they lived in the same neighborhood with some people by the name of, or spelled G-O-I-N-S. So they all sort of looked like, and they would be asking, are you a Cummins or a going? <laughs> Cummins or going? I don't know. Uh, silly stuff, silly stuff. But uh, anyway, we've got some precious, precious uh, uh, verses of scripture we're going to share all the way back in the beginning. In the beginning, Genesis chapter 6, and let me read just a, a couple of verses there. 
to kind of kickstart us in our thoughts about the last days. Uh, verses uh, 5, 6, and 7 in Genesis chapter 6. It says, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me, or some say regretted, that he had even made man. He got so ugly in, in that day, a long time ago, uh, and we look at what God was looking at man that day. He was looking on the inside. You know, God still looks on the inside. The heart of man, uh, it's not the exterior, whether we are, you know, beauty is vain, the Bible says. Uh, girls, you don't like to hear that, but that's what the Bible teaches. But God is looking at the heart. And he was looking at the heart right before the flood. And I just read a few verses there. We'll look at some more of them about what it was like in those last days, those first of the last days that we'll call it. But other verses, it talks about the heart. You know the one in Jeremiah. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? But the next verse starts out this way. I, the Lord, search the heart. And then, of course, when Samuel, in the time of Samuel, and he was God's man, and he was to go to uh, Jesse's home, uh, who had uh, seven or eight children, and he was going to uh, uh, pick a new king. Saul was taken, the power of being king was taken away, and so Samuel went there, and he looked for the, the oldest, the tallest, the, the good-looking, broad-shouldered guys were coming in, some of the older brothers, and uh, God said to Samuel that day, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, saith the Lord. For the Lord seeth not as man, but man, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. You know, I mentioned it already about the flood, and I counted this one time for myself. I went back to the book of Genesis when God created Adam. And, became, and as it marched all the way down to Noah, to the time of Noah and the flood, maybe you've seen this before, maybe you haven't, but I counted it up and there's 1,656 years. 1,656 years approximately from the time that Adam was created until the flood came, and I read you already what the earth looked like. We're going to be looking at that in just a moment. You know, I don't know how many millions maybe of people that were born during that time period, in those days, many of them lived for a long period of time. You know that Methuselah was 969 years. Guess what year Methuselah died? 1656, the same year as the flood. And all those descendants before him, from Adam right on down to Noah, uh, everybody died except Noah, his three sons, and all their wives. So there was only eight souls were spared. And I tell you, the part of the, uh, the passage in the account of the flood that I fell in love with a long time ago, when you look at how awful things were, but I love verse 8 in Genesis where it says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Wow, the grace of God right there. Uh, although God was looking at the heart of man, and what did he see? Only evil continually. What does the heart of man look like today? Again, rehearsing about that first of the last days was before the flood came. And we already talked about what it looked like. But there was an, some events in the earlier part of that chapter that talk about that. And he uses these phrases. The sons of God uh, saw the daughters of men. And everybody's tried to interpret who are the sons of God and who are the daughters of men. And, and there's two or three that uh, I've come across. Uh, the sons of God... Uh, some say were fallen angels. The old devil had uh, took a third, remember, out of heaven. And that maybe those fallen angels uh, wanted to intermingle with the women. And there were never giants that came out of all that. I mean, it was uh, ugly when you, you see the scene that God seen as he looked at the heart of man. Some say that the daughters of men were Canaanites. And that those sons of God were the Sethites, or the ones that came out of the, the seed of Adam and Eve, Seth. And uh, then, of course, Cain, 
uh, and the ones that came up in his, and they intermarried. Uh, so it's an ugly picture that God is painting for us when we look at the first of the last days. Now, one uh, thing that uh, if you got your Bibles, you'd care to turn to Luke chapter 17. There's uh, some verses there, uh, and uh, it'll be the last days according to Jesus. In Luke 17, verse 26 and following, it says, And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. That was Jesus teaching that generation in the New Testament age about what it was going to look like when he returned. And he was looking at it. He said, now what you need to do is go back and look what it was like in the days of Noah. And we read that earlier, but it, God looked at the heart of man in those days, and, and all he seen was wickedness and evil continually. And Jesus said, that's what it's going to be like when I come back. He also went on in a verse below there. He says, as it was in the days of Lot. Now, if you remember Lot, he was a nephew, I believe, of Abraham. <clears throat> and uh, he pitched his tw tent towards Sodom. And, and the word sodomite comes from this, from the Bible, Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, homosexuality and running rampant and the ugliness and, and vulgarness of it all that God says, and uh, that city, it says, uh, uh, Jesus said it, likewise, as it is in the days of Lot, what they, they ate, they, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, and they built it. But the same day that Lot was taken out by the angels, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. And he ends his thought there in verse 30 saying, Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. So even Jesus, when he described the last days, he made reference back to the, the Old Testament about the of days before the flood as he looked at the heart of man. And then when uh, Sodom and Gomorrah in chapters, well, it was mentioned in 13, 18, and 19, I believe, of the book of Genesis, you'll see all of that. And it grieved God when he, just to see the heart of man. So in the last days, when the apostle Paul comes on the scene, now this may be a little bit more familiar with uh, some of us. We think about the last days. I, I quote that verse often uh, in 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, the first five verses, and it begins this way. Paul said, This know also that in the last days perilous times will come. And that word perilous means difficult, dangerous, or furious times. Now you can describe it, and, and Paul does. We'll give you the words that he uses. But we're looking, are we in that day? That's what I'm driving at. Because when he said that, he said, uh, For men shall be lovers of their own selves... They'll be covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And then he added this, from such, turn away. That was the Apostle Paul in his early, in the New Testament, teaching about what it was going to be like in the last days. This was the ugliness. As we look at our day then, what will we see? <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> what does God see when he looks at the heart of man today? When I thought I was going to make a longer list, but I thought, no, that would go on for a long, long time. But the first thing that came to my mind was abortion. When God is looking at our world today, and I know, you know, the Roe versus Wade in 1973. And someone kept count, I guess. And anyway, according to the statistics I was reading, there was at least 63 million babies who've been killed, murdered by abortion since that date unfolded. And I know it's one of those subjects, and, you know, you got euphemisms where they want something to sound good instead of saying, 
uh, I am for oh, uh, abortion. They say uh, pro-choice. That sounds better. Some people don't know. And then we, as God's children, uh, say pro-life. We believe that life begins at conception. And I know that there's controversies and there'll be arguments about all these things. But when I see God looking at our world today, I, I see that as one of the main topics that would sadden him as he sees how wicked and evil this world is. Proverbs chapter 6. Some of you know that there's a passage or two there, or a few verses, that talks about six things that God hates. And here's the first three. A proud look a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. I don't know all about that subject, but I seen a, a film years ago called The Silent Scream, and it depicted abortion and depicted uh, a baby in a, with a sonogram image or whatever of being literally... Uh, salted and then sucked out of the mother and on the face of the baby was a scream the silent scream couldn't be heard in our world but that just stuck in my heart when I looked at how terrible uh, and the agony and punishment that a child got murdered by its own mama really the second, the second thing I kind of put two things together um, drugs and alcohol. I know we, we've, alcohol has been uh, legal for uh, adults, we'll say, for a long time now, and they had fights about that years ago. Uh, but uh, I read this statistic, and I almost questioned it. It said that 87%, now this is alcohol, first of all, 87% of young people, we'll say over, over 18 and over, 87% said that they had used alcohol in their life. So that's pretty close to 100, isn't it? Oh, that's just alcohol. And then when you get into the drug part, I, I only get a few little things, but um, heroin said there was 800,000 users of heroin in America. And the number has tripled in the last 11 years. Fentanyl, 70,000 deaths per year. And truly, our family has example. It destroys families. Some say, well, marijuana is not too bad. Or, you know, um, a drink every once in a while is not too bad. Well, those are usually the start of something worse. You, you just take a drink. My dad was an alcoholic, and I, I never forget what he said to me one time when he, he'd go, uh, go off the wagon, on the wagon, you know, back and forth, and he's, he admitted to me, he said, son, I am one drink away from a drunk, because he knew if he took one, he couldn't stop, and it, it was a disease and destroyed my father's life. He died at age 62, probably because of alcohol. Marijuana, I didn't see any of that when I was young at all. I uh, never was exposed to that. But I know now, seeing evidence of even family members, how it destroys and uh, over a period of time. They say, well, it's not that big a deal. It's not that big a deal. But it, that's where the drug addicts starts from, is starting to use marijuana. And then they got to have something stronger and something stronger and something stronger. You know, in the Bible, it tells, in Mark chapter 5, it talks about a man, we call him the maniac of Gadara. And it reminds me of what we're talking about here, uh, because um, they, they went to a place uh, in the Gadarenes, and uh, Jesus did, and when he came out of the ship, immediately they met him uh, out of the tombs, out of the graveyard, a man with an unclean spirit who was dwelling him. He lived in the graveyard, basically. And they said he, he, he was untamed in a sense. He was wild. Uh, nobody could tame him. And he said he spent night and day in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But Jesus said to the demon in him, 
Come out of this man, thou unclean spirit. And if you look at that and the change, well, that's what I'm getting to, is even though he would have been totally consumed with his behavior and even self-destruct trying to cut himself and, and all that went through. And I love the picture at the end of it all when the change, Jesus came into heart, his heart and life and the change. And here's what the verse uh, f- um, four, uh, 15 says. And they come to Jesus and they see him, the one that w- was possessed with the devil and had the legion, 2,000 maybe, uh, uh, le- uh, legion of demons in him. And here's the words they use. They seen him, he was seated, he was clothed, and he was in his right mind. And that was a picture that I'm getting of someone that came out of that ugly world and of all the vulgar nastiness and everything involved with drugs and, and uh, misuse of all those things. And uh, then the change, the change that God can make in a person's life. That you can be, instead of being uh, living in the graveyard and running around naked and cutting yourself and all that was going on, he was seated, he was, had his clothes on, and he was in his right mind. God can do that, and he can do it today. It could happen to you today. It could happen to you today. Not only abortion and drugs and alcohol, but homosexuality came to my mind. And Romans chapter 1 is one of the best places that you can go to in a study there. In Romans chapter 1, verses 24 to 32, uh, said, Wherefore God also gave them up, to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. <clears throat> for this cause God gave them up into, unto vile affection for even their women did change the natural use into the, that which is against nature and likewise also the men leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, without natural affection, Deceit, malignant, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, implacable, unmerciful. And then verse 32 ends this way. Who knowing the judgment of God, they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. And I went back, which I mentioned before, about Sodom and Gomorrah and the destruction that came. Uh, Just a verse or two in each of those areas where they were mentioned in Genesis. Genesis 13, 13 says, But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord exceedingly. Chapter 18, verse 20 in Genesis. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous. And in chapter 19, verse 24, Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. What does God see when he looks at the heart of man today. There's a couple of other things that came to my heart when I was thinking about this. Uh, The next one was, there's no truth. Outside this Bible, folks, I can't find truth anymore. You know, the old cliche was, seeing is believing? Not anymore. They can take your picture and put your head on somebody else's body Make your lips move and put a quote in that's your voice coming out. You didn't say it. That's not even you. And yet anybody that seen a picture like that would swear it's you and would swear you say that. You don't know what's truth anymore, folks. Everybody is distorting. It's like truth only uh, comes into play uh, because it's my truth. Whatever I say is truth and not believing anybody. 
I, I'm saying, and you, I'm going to repeat this probably several more times, but I, I can't get over what God is seeing as he looks at the heart of man today. He got sickened before the flood because all he's seen in the heart of man was evil continually. And now we progress down to where we are. Almost 4,400 years later, what does God see in our hearts? Thank you, Lord, for the Bible, the Word of God. You can open it. Now, we may, I don't claim to be a, I'm a student, always will be a student, that I understand every little detail. No, that's not true. I keep studying and studying, and God will keep revealing and revealing. Because there, there's so much. But I am so thankful for the Word of God. When I was in Bible college as a baby Christian, really, and I was an adult man. I didn't get saved until I was 35. So I was there until I was 30. No, I went there when I was 38. And our pastor, my son, was 17. And we, we sat side by side in the first semester of classes. And both of us had to make straight A's because we didn't let, let down on the other guy, you know. But, uh, but anyway... Uh, all that w- was going on and what God was doing in that day, uh, it, it, you know, there were things that were happening that are just exactly what I see today. But I'm glad when this book, I had a bibliology class and they asked us to write a paper on that. So I go to the library and, I, and you talk about looking up something, look up uh, the Bible and the background and bring it forward. I mean, it, it, it seemed to me to be hundreds of, of volumes of things to read about that. I wrote my paper. I couldn't tell you anything hardly about what it contained. I just borrowed from this person, that person, all the readings that I went through. But I got down to this at the end. Part of my conclusion was something like this. Thank you, God, for preserving your word that when I needed to hear the gospel message, it was there and from the pages of the, of the blessed book, uh, the words that if I would call for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That I could be saved because I, the truth was still there. God preserved it. The devil tried to change it all the time. Man tries to rewrite it. It goes on and on with all those things. But my God has preserved it and we still have truth in the word of God. And I am so, so grateful for that. In Isaiah, it says, chapter 5, uh, verse 20, says, Woe unto them that call, e- that, call good, that call evil good and good evil, that put lightness, or darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We're in a day like that. They just distort, use the, with, the, with the language and twist the words around. And now something that should be obvious that it's wrong and evil, no, that's all right. Go ahead. You, you can do these things now. Just eat, drink, and be merry. The philosophy of the world. I'm glad I've got the Bible. The Bible says in Romans 3, let God be true and every man a liar. That's pretty plain, isn't it? And... Uh, we're in that day when they've twisted things around. And uh, what, uh, I don't know, we, we used to use those old expressions, you know, grandma would turn over in her grave if she came and whatever the thing may be. But it's true. I mean, that, that, the society that we have today, my, not fear, my concern in this message is maybe our hearts today look like it did before the flood. And God said the heart of man was, was, only, was wicked and uh, evil continually in the heart of man. What does God see today as he looks at the heart of man? John 4, 1, 14, of course, it talks about the Lord Jesus himself. Called him the Word, if you remember. The Word was with God. And then in verse 14, it talked about the Word, capital W-O-R-D, talking about Jesus himself. The Word uh, was... Uh, uh, made flesh and dwelt among us, and uh, we beheld the glory, the glory of the only begotten, the Father, full of grace and truth. I love that. Full of grace and truth. I like the order, too. It, when you talk about grace and truth and put them in that order, grace coming before truth, uh, I, I like to explain it this way or look at it this way at least. Uh, that what is grace? Grace is giving somebody something they don't deserve. You know, we always use the old 
definition, unmerited favor, which we don't use those kind of words. But that's what, it, that's what grace is all about. It, it's, to me, I think of it as heaven. I get to go to heaven even though I don't deserve it by the grace of God. And then mercy, you know, is the opposite. Mercy is you don't, get to go to, you don't go to hell where you do deserve. And so putting those things together. But Jesus, you know, truth would be, as I said a moment ago, would be the Bible. And so when Jesus came, he changed. used to be give them the truth and then show them grace. But Jesus changed it. He, showed, he gave them uh, undeserved kindness before he gave them the truth, the word of God. That's what the Bible teaches here. And, of course, John, remember John 14, 6, we say it often here at the church where Jesus explained to those men that day and said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life, eternal life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. All about the truth. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, Thy word is true. We've got something here. Hard to find truth outside. Hard to find truth out there. And whether you can come back and swear to something you've seen, I'm telling you, uh, you be careful with that. Anybody ever been tripped up on the online stuff when somebody says something and you acknowledge it or whatever? Uh, there's things on there that they're just twisting you around and trying to convince you that some falsehood is truth. And it's working, apparently. So no truth outside the Word of God. And in my list, the last one I put down was no real. You know what agape means? God love, agape love. No real love. The verses, some of the verses I read, I'm not going to repeat them for you, but... Uh, one of the strong ones in Timothy's writings, uh, lovers of selves, lovers of selves. It's all about me, narcissism. The whole world travels around me. It's what, what I want, what I desire. There are many, many people, that's their whole mentality, that if we're not careful, yeah, they're lovers of something, but they're lovers of themselves. That's not God's type of love that he, that he demonstrates in his scripture. Lovers of money, greed. I, I'm going to get some more. The people in the Bible, we, we know the passage that, Tim, that uh, Paul taught to Timothy. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's not, not money. It's the love of money is the root of all evil. And some people love money, and that is their basis for everything they do or don't do based on that. And the third one was lovers of pleasure. Pleasure. Satisfy this flesh. Eat, drink, and be merry. Whatever we want. But I think when you just look at the scripture, what it teaches. In fact, uh, the first and great commandment in the Bible, according to Matthew uh, Gospel, talks about, and you know the verse, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. How sad it must be for God the Father to look at the heart of man today and see the mess that we've made. Praise him. If you would come, we'll prepare for the invitation. You know, the invitation to me, uh, I put one word as a start for it, even though there are several words uh, that I'll share with you. Uh, but the one word is that encompasses everybody is whosoever I love when the Bible uh, doesn't eliminate anybody some people say well he can't be saved because he did this that or there or she can't be saved people we're, we're looking at the exterior we're looking at the, what comes out of their mouths maybe and I know by their fruit you shall know them but at the same time God's the one that remember he's looking at the heart he knows who his children are but I love the invitation for folks to be saved and to come to the Lord when it says whosoever. Whosoever includes all of us. And even the most wicked person in this room, whoever you, whoever you may be, and if you don't know the Lord, uh, you can. Today could be the day of salvation. Again, we're looking back and we're seeing 
uh, what the heart of man looked like before the flood in particular, and then carry that forward through what Jesus taught about, what Paul taught about, and then when we see, again, this whosoever will. Uh, Revelation 22, the last chapter of the Bible, goes along with that. It says, The Spirit and the bride say, Come. Let him that heareth say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. That's the imitation that God has. Ezekiel, now I will give them one heart and will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their, and give them a heart of flesh. And then the Romans road where I got saved. Verse 9 and 10 of Romans chapter 10. Thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And then the last ver a word that we, we've already shared, but verse 13. I believe if there's a, a verse in the scripture that has stuck in my mind and heart, uh, I read it and reread it uh, the day I got saved. I came forward in a church like this, and there was a man, Jerry Pelfrey. He went home to be with the Lord a short time ago. And he took the Bible and he showed me that I was a sinner and walked down in this verse 13 of Romans 10 where it says, whosoever. He said, Charlie, you can take that and put your name right there. And I did that. And then I repeated the verse. If Charlie would call upon the name of the Lord, I could be saved. Wow. Now, prayer wasn't much. You know, I mentioned to you earlier about uh, verse 8 of Genesis chapter 6. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I know God is looking for that. You know, when Jesus came to earth, he said he came to seek and to save that which was lost. I think God's still looking today. Remember, he looks at the heart, and he knows your heart. You can't hide anything from God. There are people who came and they, with their behavior and, and uh, things, you would swear that they're, they're a Christian. They know the Lord. And yet, down the road of time, they come and receive Christ as their Savior. And people are, what? I thought that person was saved. But they had not. They did not have that peace. The Bible talks about a peace that passes all understanding. Boy, that is so precious in life. To know for sure that when you die, you're going to heaven. No doubt, there's nothing more precious than when you're walking in this life than to know for sure. And the Bible says you can know. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know, K-N-O-W, that you may know that you have eternal life. I don't deserve it, but I'm grateful to have it. In the last days, there's going to be a D-Day. There's going to be an H hour. Will you be left behind? Let me tell you a little story, uh, preparing for our imitation. But let me tell you a little story. Uh, the old devil and some of his demons got together and they said, you know, we need to come up with a plan of how we're going to keep people from getting saved and keep people out of heaven. What are we going to tell them? And the first demon raised his hand and he says, let's tell them there is no God. The old devil thought about it and said, no, no, no. He said, they can tell by creation there's a God. Look at all everything. Something else. Another one raised his hand. Let's tell them there's no heaven. And the routine went again. The old devil, well, no, I don't think, I don't think that we can sell that to him. And the third one said, Let's tell them there's no hell. Everything will be fine. No, that won't do it. And the last or the fourth one, and this is the one the devil chose. Let's tell them there's no hurry. You can do it tomorrow. You can procrastinate. I know people, I don't know thousands, but I know several people that I've met who were in a church service like this and walked out after an invitation like this and uh, 
didn't come back. They had intentions of coming back, but they died on the way home or within that week before the next Sunday. Uh, car wrecks and all kinds of things happen, and they weren't prepared. And that's where the devil wins the victory. He tells people there's no hurry. You can do that later. And the suffering of that soul uh, by saying no to God. Now, I don't know. Some teach that God never gives up on anybody. I tend to go along with that. But uh, some say, well, uh, the, the scripture says, which is in our text this morning, uh, the spirit of God shall not always deal with man, dwell with man. So the spirit of, spirit of God is working. That's the, the element of God that speaks to our heart on the inside and saying you're still accountable for your sin. You need to repent of your sin. You need to cr trust Jesus as your Savior. And that's the invitation that God has today. Are you saved? Do you know for sure when you die that heaven will be your home? We are in the last days. Father, bless now as we extend the invitation, Lord, and we'll sing a verse or so of, of music, Lord, and give the people opportunity to do what you've told them to do, Lord. Maybe today. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Stay to worship with us.
It has been great to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and I am so privileged to even be back here. Last weekend, I was in Florida, and while I love Florida, man, there's nothing like being home. And man, worshiping with uh, other believers within uh, the church congregation, I am so glad to see you all today. And I want to just uh, tell you all thank you. Thank you for signing up for VBS. If you haven't yet signed up to v in VBS and you want to serve in VBS, uh, there's a, a place down uh, as you're leaving. You'll see a little sign-up place for you to sign up for meals if you've forgotten to do that or if you need a T-shirt and you're a worker because tomorrow morning the order is supposed to go in for our T-shirts. So if you're going to help with VBS, we need that information in uh, by today, okay? So uh, if you're not going to help with VBS, we'll... We'll get you involved somehow, some way. We want you to be involved because, you know what, ministering to the kids in this community is a huge deal, and we're so thankful for that. Um, Brother Charlie, thank you for that message today. Guys, ladies and gentlemen, we need to check our heart every day, and this right ne here needs to be the standard in with which we check it. So make sure today you check your heart. Check where it's at because if it's not where God wants it, guess what? You need to, to get in this word and figure out what God has for you so that you might do some change there. There's some announcements I've been asked to share with you today, and so I'll do that, and then we'll dismiss you in prayer. Uh, today, Celebrate Recovery is having a, a meal uh, for everyone that wants to stay after the second service. Uh, it's a donation-based, and, and it helps their ministry so that they can reach out to more people within this community. And if you'd like to uh, stay and be a part of that meal, that's awesome. If you can't stay, but you want to be a blessing to Celebrate Recovery, just outside the doors there they have a table set up and you can uh, leave a blessing there if you would like uh, it's up to totally up to you also today is the last day they say to sign up for our summer camps uh, I will tell you that for a children's camp I'll take you to the day we leave okay so um, if you're a if you have a child that wants to go to camp we can take you to the day we leave but we would like to know that you're interested in going that'd be awesome uh, but for high school and middle school camp they need to know today uh, if you uh, are going to camp so parents if you haven't signed your kid up please make sure to do that there will be D groups tonight for those of you that are in the D group and so uh, make sure you take note of that Lord 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 God we thank you for bringing us to your house today we thank you for each and every person who is uh, in a attendance, whether they're here in person or God, uh, they're watching online. We thank you for who you are and what you're doing. And Lord, we just ask that God, as we leave this place, the challenge that was presented to us today to check our hearts, where are we at? Do a little heart evaluation, spiritually speaking, as to where we're at with walk with you. And I pray, God, that as we go home today, that that might be on our mind and the forefront of our hearts so that we might deal with you today and that we might uh, discuss with you where we're at. And God, if we're not where we're supposed to be, I pray that uh, you'd, you'd draw that out of our minds and our hearts and that we might settle that with you today. And God, if we're walking with you as friend with friend, God, might we never take our eyes off of you. We thank you, Lord, for your love for us. We ask God you'd bless the rest of this day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You are dismissed.